Oh, hello. This is Ron Kellis with another episode of Automation Unplugged. Today is Wednesday, December 8th. It's uh, just a little bit after 12.30 p.m. I am hoping I'm streaming on Facebook. I'm actually going to jump over to Facebook and I'm going to check that out. Uh, and then I, my software is giving me a warning that maybe I am not streaming on LinkedIn. So uh, we're living dangerously here, people. We're living on the edge of streaming technology. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and jump over to Facebook and see if we are streaming. It does seem that we are streaming, which is positive. And uh, I do not yet know if we are streaming live on LinkedIn. So I'm going to ask my team. There, I see David. He's jumping into Slack. He's going to let me know. We are live on Facebook and LinkedIn. Awesome. Isn't that cool? Well, I know it's been, uh, <clears throat> I want to say, a couple of weeks since we did a show. Uh, I promise we did try very diligently to get a show in last week. Uh, I was traveling uh, Wednesday and Thursday over to uh, Lutron headquarters in uh, Coopersburg, Ver uh, not Virginia, Coopersburg, PA. So we tried to do a show on Tuesday. And uh, long story short, technology was not behaving. And we're actually going to bring that guest, which is our very own Brenna, uh, and she is a writer and an SEO specialist, and she's going to come on the show Friday. So if you want to learn more about marketing and SEO uh, from a, a practitioner here at One Firefly, you want to make sure to tune into that. Uh, and what else? Uh, it's December. I hope you all have uh, you know a good couple of weeks of hard work planned and then some good relaxation planned uh, for the end of the month with friends and family. I know I've got some of that scheduled myself. And uh, But hey, the year is not over. We run a fiscal January to December and we have goals to hit. So we're all hands on deck here at One Firefly. We're, we're hustling our butts off. And uh, I see Tomas says hello. Uh, hello, Tomas. Thanks for tuning in from Panama. Awesome to see you. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're actually going to talk about doing projects in other countries today. So, Tomas, you might find some of that particularly interesting. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's jump in. So, this, this week, we are uh, recording show 195. And uh, my guest is Bill Simpkins. He is the founder and CEO of IGS Homeworks. And he's based uh, there in the, the Houston, Texas market. And uh, he'll tell us more about specifically where he's located and, and what type of work he does. But let's go ahead and bring in Bill and uh, let's, let's start the fun. Bill, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Ron. How are you today? I am doing super. Where are you coming to us from exactly? <clears throat> I'm coming to you live from the Woodlands at Texas, just north of Houston. The Woodlands. The Woodlands is a, a suburb of Houston? It's a township about 35 miles north of Houston. Uh, part of uh, it's a Howard, Howard Hughes development, uh, master plan community. Like Howard Hughes, the, the famous guy of... Yeah. of you know, out of Dallas, the Howard Hughes Corporation. Yeah, so the Woodlands is part of the Howard Hughes Corporation. No way. Yeah, I didn't know. I guess there's probably tremendous amounts I don't know. What, what's coming to mind for me when you say Howard Hughes is the Leonardo Di, DiCaprio uh, movie that he made about Howard Hughes, and uh, and that guy was a, an interesting guy for sure. But I had no idea that their business also did communities or. Yep. Was this a right. thing of the past? They don't do this anymore, correct? No, they, they're still very active in the market. This is uh, the Woodlands Township was acquired by the Howard Hughes Corporation maybe 2015 or so. I can't remember exactly the, the okay. date. Uh, before that, it was just the Woodlands Township uh, started by a, a guy in the 1970s who wanted to create a community for families to live, prosper. 
Now, you did not get that accent in the Woodlands, Texas. Uh, so where where is maybe your family from or where where is this accent from? So I'm originally from Glasgow, Scotland, way back. Uh, right. Travel. I got here via London, England and Manchester, England, and then to the Woodlands. So a bit of a journey. Got it. We're going to go into some of that journey today. Uh, maybe we could start... Uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about uh, IGS Homeworks. What type of, what, tell us about the business. What type of projects do you do? How big is your team? Where do you do these, where do you do these projects? So IGS Homeworks, uh, we founded in 2014 and our primary focus was the luxury residential market. So we work with luxury home builders, custom home builders uh, to deploy the full automation systems. So control systems, audio, video, lighting, the whole the whole gamut. Uh, we recently more got into uh, battery and energy management as well. Okay. And your projects are primarily there in Texas, or do you do you do them outside of Texas? So they're originally most of the projects were in and around this local area. There was a huge growth. Uh, area. Uh, most of the woodlands is now actually built out, so we started to look further afield. Uh, we were very fortunate to be invited on to uh, a project at a golf resort called Blue Jack National, which is the first Tiger Woods design golf course in the United States, mm -hmm. which is, you know, 20 miles north of the woodlands in Montgomery County, Texas. And uh, that got us into uh, golf resort work as well. So uh, installing control systems into the developers, developer built product, and also the estate lots that they were selling to custom homeowners as well. And from there, that kind of expanded into, we're now in three different golf resorts. There's one in Austin, one in um, Fredericksburg, and we're actually looking at another one now in uh, the Bahamas. Got it. What do, what is construction like right now in Texas for our listeners listening around the world? What what is it like there? It's crazy right now. There's people are moving to flocking to Texas from all over the United States. Uh, Austin is absolutely blowing up right now. Uh, house prices are going through the roof. Uh, people are coming in from California. Uh, it's an exciting time to be in Texas for sure. Exciting time to own real estate, <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. yeah, that too. That too. All right, well, let's let's go back in time. Uh, my audience uh, always loves to hear the origin story. How how did you? What what is your past? And you have a pretty fun and uh, dynamic past, uh, doing all sorts of crazy things all over the world. Uh, what is that past that led us to the present where you're running this very successful integration business here in Texas? Well, it's a, quite a convoluted story, but I'll, I'll summarize it for, for your listeners. Ta take uh, your time. We, we always enjoy listening. <laughs> so I've been in this uh, industry for 30 years in technology, various guises of technology. I started out in 1991 in Glasgow working for a, a leisure company that operated leisure venues. And I got introduced to the technology there. I was actually um, studying computer science at college. And when the, the owners of the venue found out that I knew a bit about new computers, they said, do you know how to work this, this box that controls all the lighting in the venue? I was like, it's a computer. Let me have a look at it. And I had to go at it. And they're like, right, you need to be here every night. <laughs> and that started that and we that, might even pay you <laughs> and that's that, that and that was that was the start of it and i i learned i learned that industry i learned the 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 lighting industry and the the audio industry through through live work uh live performance work uh we moved on to uh working for a rental company uh eventually i i got posted to london when the owners of the business opened a huge new venue in at Leicester Square in London. It's called, it was called, the venue was called Home, the address was number one Leicester Square. It was seven floors, it had three clubs, bars, fine dining restaurants, cafes, the whole, the whole thing. And I was there looking after all the technology. Mm. Uh, we did that for a couple of years. 
And uh, unfortunately, uh, that didn't quite work out for the owners and they decided to close down that venue. And I was 30 years old in London and wasn't quite sure what the next step would be. And what I did realize is what I didn't want to be in that industry as I got older. So I took the skills that I'd acquired over the previous 10 years and reached out to some people who I had met through the industry who had what we call CI businesses. And the, the first CI business I went into uh, was a, a corporate CI business. Mm. So I got introduced to boardrooms, designing audio conferencing systems, and funnily enough, very early into video conferencing systems. So what people, today is very common, you know, Zoom, we were doing Tanberg way back in the early 2000s, uh, trying to educate users and the benefits of remote working which is quite ironic now, considering everything that's happened, you know, we were 20 years ahead of that, but um, it was, a, it, I learned a lot. It, most of our customers, just because of the price point of technology, it was enterprise customers. So, you know, we we're working for some big, big companies. And I, eventually I, I got seconded uh, to a large international commodity trader uh, to take care of their global video fulfillment program, which meant traveling around the world, deploying, or managing the deployment of video systems. Mm. Uh, that got me through to about 2012 when I came through to Houston and uh, met up with an old buddy from the technology company in London. And little did I know at that point that he was actually now a custom home builder in the luxury market in Houston. And he said, would you like to come out here, set up a technology business, I'll help you get started, I'll give you the work that I've got and you can, you know, grow your business from there. And I said, well, you know, let me think about it. We just started a, fa a young family, had to go back to the wife and say, hey, how do you fancy moving to the States? So that took a bit of convincing and a couple of years of planning and doing everything you need to do to get the, uh, the correct visas and get the business set up. In 2014, we arrived here in the Woodlands and started a business. It sounds like a dream almost. You walked in with a flow of business all out of the gate because of your relationship. Yeah, that was extremely fortunate. Then we're, that helped us massively, for sure. And then the business, how has the business evolved 2014 to the present? So we are focused, as I said, on the, the luxury business. Uh, we've had to spread our wings slightly and venture further afield and that takes us into different communities and into Austin and and over and also uh, we started to pick up some international work. I was, I was asked if we'd be interested in international work. Some of our uh, customers have second homes, beach houses, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, places like that. And they said, do you, would you take on a project like that? You know, and of course, with my background, I didn't see an issue with that. I thought, no, that's well within our capabilities. Now, the look in the face of the people that were working with me at the time was completely different. They, were, say they must have they had the fear of God in them. Terrified. Yeah. They'd never been exposed to anything like that. They never had to work out of state. They never knew what went into the planning and execution of, of international deployment. But we're doing it, and we're doing it successfully. So, so I'm happy I, about I, that. I want to go back. And, and in the early 2000s, you were – working you know in the early days and maybe you could clarify kind of what your role was but you you had mentioned that you were doing in the early days setting up video conferencing for clients globally you mentioned you had done some work for a commodities trader and, and they were setting up i guess commodities i mean that's stuff you're digging out of the ground right you're digging or pumping out of the ground and so i'm imagining you got sent all over the world what, what were some of those adventures like? You're absolutely right. Uh, we could be, one week I could be working in a, a major financial hub in a really, really nice part of the world. You know, I've spent a long, a lot of time in Geneva, in Switzerland, uh, Shanghai, London, major financial hubs where they had business interests. But as you said, quite rightly, their core business is extracting commodities from the ground. And some of the locations they do that, they have satellite offices, and of course they need to bring the telecommunications into the 
corporate offices. So, you know, that could be, again, South America, South Africa, remote places, you know, that people don't normally travel to. And uh, you what know, was one of the crazier adventures uh, that you had maybe when you were doing some of these travels or what, you know, just for our audience to kind of understand the shock and awe sometimes of landing in a foreign land and being expected to make big things happen. A couple of things bring to mind. Uh, one of them was an eye opening. It was a complete eye opener. And the other one was just truly terrifying. Uh, the eye-opening one was, you know, we were used to working in London with all the health and safety regulations that go with that, uh, really very strict, you know, risk assessments, method statements, PPE, all of that. When I landed in Africa and I walked onto a job site and there was just people everywhere, there was no PPE, there was welding going on, there was people cutting metal without any safety wear and their eyes or anything there's sparks flying everywhere there's machines without guards you know and i, I was just thought oh my goodness what, what have i walked into but you know this is just how they operate you know and that was that was eye-opening for me for sure what, uh, what was it what was the expectation were you uh, uh designing the system and uh, and then shipping the gear from the UK or were you working with local talent to get the jobs done? Like what was the mechanism to get the jobs deployed and ser you know, serviced? That's a great question. It's a, a mixture of both. So being a, a Cisco reseller, we supplied all the Cisco equipment. So we would, uh, as part of a resale agreement, ship that to, to the international locations. But part of my role would be to go to, for instance, uh, I was in Montevideo in Uruguay and I had to basically find local vendors who, and typically Cisco would assist us and say there's a couple of partners here that we'd recommend and I would interview those guys and I'd make a selection, take a look at, you know, their offices, make sure they were a legitimate business and then we'd partner with those guys for the, for the local work. So, and they would supply some of the generic AV equipment but we'd supply the specialist video codecs from Cisco. So yeah, it was a, it was a a mixture of both for sure. So back in those days, and I'm, I'm going to say on the calendar, it's about 20 years ago, you were making, you know, UCC unified collaboration between home offices and satellite offices and maybe even homes. And I'm imagining that was a bit of a science project as compared to today where Zoom rooms, Teams rooms, I mean, unifying the home and office, it's fairly ubiquitous. It just rolls off the tongue. Everybody's asking for it and it seems common. Maybe help our audience understand like what did it used to be like compared to what it's like today? It certainly got a lot simpler. You know, we had to work very closely with the enterprise IT team for the company we're working with. Uh, you know, we had to have you know, VLAN set up um, for the codex. We, we, you know, we'd have to have our, right down to having our packets prioritized, you know? So it, it, it was very, very, it was quite complex and it was expensive. What and gear were you using? So 20 years ago to make a job happen, what were some of the brands and models that you were using? So the, the video equipment back then was Tanberg. That was before they were acquired by Cisco. Uh, control systems we were a big AMX user. Uh, that subsequently moved to Crestron. Um, but yeah, that was our, our main offering was Tanberg and AMX back in Got the early 2000s. Got it. I haven't heard the name AMX in a long time. Are they still around? I believe so. I believe so. I be, believe so. But today, are you an AMX house? Are you, you're a Crestron or what, what are you doing these days? We're a Crestron. We're a Crestron house. Okay. So if we, let me just look at my notes over here because I have a, a bunch of things I know that I want to dig in with you on. All right, so your custom builder friend, your custom builder friend from the UK that set up shop in Houston and he said, Bill, come on, I'm going to give you my work. Has that, is that by the way, not that you need to mention his name, but is, are you, is that relationship still intact? And how do you view doing business with custom builders versus going directly to the consumer? Do you try to build 
both paths for lead generation for your business or what's what's your focus these days so to answer your first question yes we're still very much working with the initial custom builder who invited us over here that's the relationship remains very strong that's uh, impressive so five five points you because that, that, that can't be easy over that many years no no but uh no it's a very it's a very good relationship it's worked out very well for us very happy about that uh as far as our approach to growing the business has has been very much uh engaging with the builder community and direct to to users my preference is direct to the home users from an educational perspective i want mm. my my favorite uh situation is when the homeowner tells the builder who their guy is because i've you know we've done our marketing we've done our outreach we've done our education and uh, somebody's noticed and they like what we do and they then want to engage with us so you know they'll come to us and they will introduce us to the builder relationship and i see far more far more value in that than you know going after the builders and hopefully they'll bring projects to you now both there's nothing wrong with both approaches they both work and there's been people have very successfully done both but my preference is that i get brought into a project by the end user what what are the types of in your mind, and, and I don't normally talk marketing on this show, but I am curious because you have this, you're mindful about wanting to appeal to the, 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 the homeowner and you want that referral from their friends and neighbors to do their, their projects. Is there any sort of quote unquote marketing that you do, or is it just a matter of doing a great job on the job site? What, how do you position yourself to try to get more of those referrals? So I think initially when we set the business up, the website was quite, I would say it was quite technical, quite corporate. Uh, that was my background. That's kind of what I was used to. That's what worked in, in London. Uh, when we got here, you know, it took me a little while to realize that people here are like a, don't really want that kind of relationship. They want to, they want to know their guy. So it's a much more local relationship so we softened mm. the brand a little bit and we softened the website made it more appealing to to homeowners and did more local advertising got involved with the local chamber of commerce and you know sponsored events and attended events and you know tried to engage with the local community um and that seemed to to work where we are in the woodlands and you know i think we we're now looking to replicate that in different areas that we move into you know we we don't want to be a faceless Silicon Valley technical offering technology company. You know, we want to be the local faced local guys that you go to, you know, not the, not the big box store, but you know, these are the local integrators. Tell me more about your approach to the, the chamber of commerce. I don't hear that strategy that often. So that sounds like something unique or that is uniquely um, yours. Now, if you share too much detail, there are people listening, and now it, the secret might get out. The well, what, 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 what are you willing to share that is that is proven to be successful for you in a little more detail? So for us, the Chamber of Commerce was a, a way to meet other business leaders in the community. So, and from there, you know, that basically just spread. It was brand awareness. We got to go to local events. You know, they put on uh, an event every year here, Taste of the Town, where they're bringing all the restaurants in, and you know, you can get, you can buy tickets, and you can go and sample all the food from all the great restaurants in the area. Well, you can sponsor that, and you can have your name on the merchandise for that event, and that's when the local community see, ah, hey, these are our local technology providers, and we've engaged that through the through the um, the Chamber of Commerce. So that again is part of the local outreach that we do. And also you get to meet the business community and off the back of that, you start to see some commercial jobs become a reality. That things that you maybe never went after before, but, you know, where, where you were asked, well, do you prepare to, we're opening a new office. Could you come and take care of the video system or the security system or whatever it may be? So it opened up a number of different avenues. 
Have you observed other uh, integrators, whether they're a competitor or not, practicing such strategies? I mean, are there multiple technology companies in your chamber of commerce, or are you the only one? There's a couple. There's there not. Are. There's not. There's not a huge amount. Uh, prior to the chamber of commerce, uh, we focused on the the Greater Houston Home Builders Association. But when you when I got there, I soon realized that every integrator was there. You know, mm. and I thought it's very, very hard to, you know, to make an impression there when there's so many well-established people and so many well-established relationships. So, you know, I quickly realized that that's, that's going to be, that's a tough one. So, you know, I thought about what else could we do that we could get as, into the community and with less competition. I, I think that's, that's super smart. What, what, uh, have you done, if anything, and the answer could be zero and because it's not our strategy, but I'm, I, I think this is a good strategy for some. Do you practice like outreach to designers, interior designers or architects, um, either by calling on them or doing lunch and learns or any sort of educational content? I know CDA has a lot of, um, you know, outreach or instruction CEU type content. Have you ever practiced that technique? We have reached out to some architects and some interior design firms with very limited success. I'll be perfectly honest with you. You know, again, I keep going back to, we want the homeowner to bring mm. us in and refer us into the project, you know, rather than the other way around. We seem to have more traction that way. They said, uh, there's, there's a lot of integrators going after those people, those same people. So it's, it's highly competitive. Well, let's focus on the word competitive. You're in Texas, you're in Houston. There are lots and lots of other businesses doing integration in the state and doing integration in your city. Um, how is the manpower situation right now? I know a lot of businesses are uh, that I'm talking to on a weekly basis. They're talking about having so much work, but yet maybe not enough manpower or I don't want to be sexist here, human power to get the work done. Uh, are you feeling that? And if so, kind of how are you you managing? And maybe walk us through the pandemic, like from before the pandemic and then up to the present. How are you handling kind of the hiring and the, 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 the maintaining of your team? Pre-pandemic, uh, in hindsight, I believe I was our overhead was too high. And that became uh, obvious when things started to shut down. And I could, you know, when you, you know, you can see when everybody basically froze for the first couple of months, you know, and, and the sales were not coming in and, you know, your overheads mean to say, I, I, I thought, you know, this is structurally, we're too heavy. We're too top heavy here. So we, we took some steps. We uh, reduced headcount by a little. Um, but it's mostly back office. You know, we didn't really lose anyone in the field, and we had a far too large office warehouse facility, which basically we shuttered and moved to a smaller facility very, very quickly. Hmm. Uh, we're fortunate that we could move quickly on that, and that that really helped us. Well, everybody tried to adjust to the new normal. What does this look like moving forward? How were you able to do that? Were you uh, just conveniently at the end of a lease? Yes, fortunately. That's yes. just a roll of the dice, isn't it? There was a, I, we'd, we'd been on a three-year lease and it just ended and we were rolling month to month and I was trying to understand what was happening next, whether to renew or not. Pandemic hit and I, I thought, no, this is this is it. <laughs> I can move wow. quickly. That's, oh, that, lucky. That was lucky. that's the day to go buy a lottery ticket. That was a lucky, that was a lucky draw. Yeah, for sure. And how is it today with hiring and, and kind of, you know, there's, are there a lot of demands on you from, from, you know, prospects and your clients? I mean, is business good or what's the state and how does that relate to your manpower situation? Business is extremely good. We have lots of inquiries coming in direct to us now from, from homeowners all around the city. Uh, you know, our order book for 2022 is extremely healthy. You know, I would go as far as to say it's Q1 is done. I mean, we are full. Uh, we are booking into Q2 now, 2022. Uh, so with that, 
at this time of year we start to plan the head count for next year and you know we know we need to we need to scale back up again to cope with the demand the demand right now is extremely high mm. uh the only saving grace in all of this is that with the supply issues that we've got going on lead times are stretched so it gives us a little bit of leeway to help better plan because you know the customers they know that they're going to have to wait you know before it was i want this job done next month and i'm giving it to someone else you know now you can say well sir you can't have your equipment for eight to twelve weeks and that gives me time to plan appropriately to do that to do the work so that that that's in a, in a kind of weird way some of the supply issues have actually helped well let's talk supply issues 2022 what are you seeing and how are you coping i think um just-in-time ordering is obviously gone for now, and it may not come back, you know? I'm, the more I, I think about this, I think that uh, we're going to have to hold some inventory of commonly used product, and I'm sure lots of other integration businesses around the country are, are thinking the same thing. Uh, to facilitate that, you really have to look at your product offering and rationalize that and streamline that, because we can't hold products we can't hold inventory of every single thing that we offer so we took a good look at our offering and we streamlined it and we've gone ahead and ordered inventory of most commonly used items so that that helped us you know now we need more space and we're starting to look at the fact that we're going to have to go to a bigger property again but that's just part and parcel of holding stock rather than just in time ordering process part of your rationalization process has that meant streamlining vendors that you do business with for sure for sure where where you would have a couple of control system vendors maybe to hit two different price points in the market we've just focused on one now you know this is our offering you know if take it or leave it this is what we do uh, it helps it helps with our staff it helps with their skill sets uh, it helps with as i've said before and hold an inventory and it even helps the design process and the proposal writing process because there's a lot of repetition. You, I imagine, have been subject to price increases from vendors, probably in 20, probably in 2021. Is that accurate? Absolutely. How are you handling that or protecting yourself when it comes to you contracting with your customer so that if a price increase does come along the way, it doesn't hit your bottom line? Or do you have protections in place? Fortunately, our main control system vendor uh, has not increased pricing. So that... Do you mind sharing who that is? Because that's kind of a feather in their cap. Who is that? Crestron. Crestron has not raised prices? No. So that's been very helpful. Uh, as far as other items, typically we, you know, we go back to the, the customer and we've been doing this for, for many years in, in the TV market. The TV market prices change week to week. So we typically give a budget for those what we call more commodity items. And we'll say to the customer, we're going to revisit this near at the time. You know, models may change, prices can fluctuate. And that gives us an opportunity to go back and say, okay, we're going to give you the latest and greatest model. Here's the new price. And that's typically how we handle that. Got it. Looking into, well, to wrap up 2021, did you finish this year up over 2020? And if so, do you mind sharing? Was it you know on target or was it did it blow out your target? How, how did you finish the year? So we are probably up 25% on 2020. Okay. And what's your do you have a forecast in place for 2022? I'd say I'm 25% growth again next year. Wow. So 25%, 25%. Uh, you're gonna pretty quickly have doubled the business. Yeah, so, you know, we did take we did shrink in 2020 with everything that was going on. I'd say we're probably down 30 percent that year. Okay. So although by the end of this so you year, kind of broke uh, back, then you pulled it back to 19. 10, 10, 10, yeah, and then next year we we're seeing very strong growth. Out of curiosity, do you do you say? stay strictly to residential or will you take that small commercial project and how do you think about that we will take commercial projects and some not so small uh i don't want to 
drop any names in there, but we are about to deploy all the video technology to a large police force in Texas for the command center, which is quite an exciting project. That's a commercial project. It's a proper commercial project. And it's, in and, and, you know, and we're okay with it. It's my background before I was in residential, so I'm comfortable in the space. Mm. But it's a it's a large, large commercial project. Well, that sounds exciting. Is that this is a 2022 deployment? 2022 Q1. 2022 Q1. All right. What looking into 2022? Uh, what what has you uh, excited? You know, I would say from a technology or a changes in the industry. You know, and I at a high level, I would observe that you know a lot of people underestimate what'll ha happen in the, or they overestimate what'll happen in the short term and underestimate what'll happen in the long term. So I'm asking you about the short term. What sort of big changes have you jazzed and that you think are going to affect your business? So the work from home, I think, is is here to stay. Uh, even the corporations that have gone back to the office, it's mostly flexible. It's two or three days in the office and some work from home. So we see a, a big uptick in people wanting uh, robust networks, for sure. And also with their relationship with Crestron, they have quite a few. They have their own UC products. They have their own work from home products. So, you know, we are, we're seeing an uptick in that. Which is which is great. So we we get to combine a residential offering with a commercial offering all in the client's home for exec you know senior executives of large organisations. So that's that's a shift, uh, which I think we're quite well placed for. You know we're positioned well for that, um, and you know that that I think is going to remain and become the new norm as we go forward. It's interesting. I just want to pull a thread there. <clears throat> A lot of, and we're doing more work here at One Firefly with, you know, pure commercial integrators and, you know, they by and large uh, will consider themselves quote unquote, more capable of more engineering centric engineering, dri engineered projects at scale. And, uh, and, and, an, and a residential integrator uh, typically is doing, you know, very is a whole spectrum of what it means to be a residential integrator. And then there's this small subset of residential integrators that will do commercial projects and we will call them resi commercial integrators. But what's, what's, you just hit a point that I think is not changing, which is there are going to be these executives that are going to be working from home and need to have their technology tied to the mothership to corporate for all of their phone systems, video conferencing systems and technology standards. And it's a real interesting quandary because up until now, the commercial integrator would not step into the house. Very so much who, so. This is who a does that work? We do. This is a perfect space for us. We're used to the, we're used to working within the, in the confines of, of a residential property. Work having both worked in commercial and residential properties is two very different animals. You know, the, in a commercial property, retrofitting wire and equipment is relatively simple. The building's designed in that way. Homes are not. Mm -hmm. So we have skills that we can bring into that market that I think some of the commercial guys will struggle with. Are you seeing? from your builders or your, you know, however you're landing in the project, are you finding that the home office is being taken more seriously and that it's on floor plans and that there's, are there conversations about the technology that's going to maybe go into that? And, and is there an equipment closet needed? Is, is that happening? Yes, for sure. There's an understanding from, the executives that uh, you know were working on the luxury projects for that what was before uh, the study which was you know a fairly comfortable place to to sit and work on your laptop now has to be video enabled you know so all of a sudden lighting and acoustics become an issue and good network becomes an issue and just how that technology is going to uh, be located and, and be installed becomes 
more of a, 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 a thought process, whereas before it wasn't. You know, most just about every custom home here has a study, but it was very rarely a set up for serious office work. We're seeing a change in that now. People are, are wanting proper setup, proper office, home office setup. And you think this sticks? Yeah, I think it sticks. I think that once you, once you know that you can be productive from home, why would you really want to go back to the grind of the commute if you didn't have to? You know, and if you're a senior executive, you got a lot of control over your own destiny in that in that accord. You know, you can you create the policy for yourself. You create the policy. I tell you what. I mean, I I figured this out. A number of years ago, when Firefly, we went decentralized work from home in 2015, late 2015. And I found that my personal productivity and my team's productivity went up. And so if you're now a lot of our integrators listening, they may not have the luxury. They need to be in an office to, you know, there, there's reasons to have to, to meet. But if you're in an, a situation like, for example, our business, our clients are all around the world. They're all all throughout North America. They don't need to. They don't come to my office in Coral Springs, Florida, right? They don't need to come to my office, and my team doesn't need to come to my office. It's just a, a new world, and you know, we used to be innovative, by the way, and then the pandemic happened, and then this is like, yeah, well, of course, everybody's doing that now. <clears throat> But, well, uh, like, likewise, when I was working from the UK in international projects, I was working from home. This was 2010 to 2014. I was already working. You from were ahead home. of the game then. I yeah, was that, that was home. early. Well, and so I came into this business with the mindset that working from home is a real thing. It can be productive. It can be efficient. And I've always had, you know, I've never forced an employee to come to an office just so that I can sit and watch them work nine to five. I've never done that. Uh, you know, with somebody, maybe someone's working on the design team or they're working on project management and they've got some, you know, they've got some administration to do, some design work to do. I would be the first one to say, you do that from home, less mm -hmm. distraction, you know? So we've always been uh, fairly good with that and fairly open to that. I'm mindful of time. And I, I want to dig in a little more, Bill. What other technologies coming around the corner have you jazzed? So something that we we see and we like is uh, from the control system manufacturers is a lot of the cloud services, the remote management dashboards that they're bringing in to help us uh manage those clients remotely. And, and this is a technology that's been exi existed in the IT world forever, you know, for years. You know, my previous company when I worked in UC, we had what they call the NOC, it's the Network Operations Center, and they had a dashboard and they could see all the clients. They had a 24 seven help desk, all of that stuff. So what we've tried to do is we tried to bring some of that experience and that technology into our industry. Mm. So, your IT companies and the network equipment manufacturers have had self-healing products for a while now. You know, it will ping devices, and if it doesn't um, respond, it will use PoE and it will, uh, it will reboot. That's very common in the IT world. It's, it's, it's standard in the IT world. Now, here in our industry, some of the control system manufacturers are latching onto that, and Crestron are now, you know, bringing self-healing into the control systems which for us is very exciting, especially with international projects. You know, we can uh, we can do a lot more remotely and the client can do a lot more as well from the control system. It, it, and I, I might have this mixed up. I know that we at One Firefly, we just developed for one of our clients some web and marketing content around Crestron XIO. Are, is what you're referring to XIO or is there... Uh, is that a different product or family? It's a different. It's a different product. Correct. Christian XIO is uh, a management tool for managing their uh, video and audio over IP solutions and the UC solutions. You know, a great product, great for large deployments. You know, college campuses, that kind of thing. That's the fantastic product. I'm speaking more specifically around the Crestron home platform mm -hmm. and the new uh, IP control Crestron 
power distribution systems that the Crestron Home platform will allow the home the homeowner the user to you know auto reboot a device such as that locked up it could be an Apple TV and just by holding down the button on the user interface it will set the control system will send a signal to the power distribution unit to reboot that device and that's that's new we like it a lot it uh, it gives the homeowner um, more control over their system uh, it gives the homeowner more comfort that they know they can do that and you know we also have access to 24 7 help desk as well which we use for you know to give the clients the, the, the security that they can get help with this technology at any time so you know we we've adopt, we've embraced some of the technologies that we learn from the IT world I'm going to have a follow-up question on that, but I want to give Josh, uh, one of our, our listeners, he posted a, a comment and he says, uh, the first thing I noticed when I started working remotely from home in 2008 was the lack of distractions. I was actually more productive, contrary to what most people thought would happen if you work from home. And uh, Josh, thanks for tuning in, uh, bud. And uh, I agree. I found that I was exceptionally more productive from home, but I guess it's not fair because I've always worked from home. So uh, for 21 years, uh, I've I've worked my from home. I guess there was a little bit of one firefly where I would go to the office, but uh, uh, and then Tomas posted a comment. He says Crestron Home is great is a great evolving platform. We've had great success since it came out, um, and so that that is exciting at Crestron that they are putting so much energy and engineering horsepower into that product. And I, I agree, they have a lot of momentum. I've been hearing a lot of good things. Bill, how do you handle, like, so this is Crestron investing in the software and it's getting better and it's enabling and empowering you to better serve your clients and serve them over the life of that relationship. Are you, how do you handle that life long relationship do you sell them a service and maintenance plan do they just assume that you will do these things and that the manufacturer will do these things or the business model of after sale service do you mind maybe talking high level how you think about that for sure uh, after sale service uh is vitally important i believe is vitally important to a business like ours i i'll give you an example uh when the pandemic hit and everybody froze and everything shut down, you know, I could say to the sales team, I said, okay, you know, new business meetings are going to be very difficult, if not impossible right now. I want you to go back through all of our client base, all the way back to 2014 and touch base with every single one of these clients. Tell them we're still here. Tell them we're still in business. We're operating through the pandemic as an essential service. How can we help? We know that you could be working from home. Is your network robust? We know that your kids can't get to the movie theaters. Did you upgrade your theater to the latest 4K technology? We, you know, and we went through our whole client database and we generated a lot of business from that. And then we're able to do that because we we believe in client retention. You know, we don't want to install a system and then be gone to the next capital project. We want to build that relationship and maintain that relationship. And part of that relationship maintenance is to do with selling service plans, selling access to a help desk, which of course then generates RMR for us. That's a fundamental part of our business. And again, it proved to be successful when the pandemic hit. We had an existing happy client base that were happy to talk to us again. You mentioned uh, help desk. Do you use a uh, an off the shelf help desk software for ticketing that keeps you organized and helps your clients? And you stay uh, connected on the issues they submit, or do you use uh, an in-house born system? We outsource it to a third party. So we're a small business. Uh, costs involved of running a 24-7 help desk and the manpower involved in that is significant. And that we could not, we could just not support that. So we partner with One Vision for the 24 seven help desk. And we work with those guys and we have done for quite a few years now and it's a great solution and we have a great partnership with those guys. That's all. Have you found that your customers are happier on the other end of that because of the immediate service they're getting or at least immediate response <clears throat> to their concerns? Yes, uh, the customers are happy that 
they can call up any time, day or night. Someone's going to take their call or call them back within a certain period of time, depending on the SLA that, that they have. Uh, sorry, service level agreement. Again, I'm kind of reverting back to the IT world, but yeah, it's a service yeah. level agreement. And um, and someone's going to triage that for them. Someone with a bit of knowledge is going to triage that for them remotely. So, you know, that and, and you know, quite often they're successful to get that client back up and running. It could be a quick fix. It could be a workaround, but the client gets through the evening. And then we will then reach out to the client the next business day, schedule service if we can't fix it remotely. And, you know, and only then do we roll a truck. And that, you know, keeps the customers far happier than the phone ringing at eight o'clock at night and trying to call one of our techs who's maybe not on call or not working and, you know, the frustrations that that creates. We, we found the help desk solution to be very successful. Your background, Bill, you, you had a background in lighting design. I know I was reading that in your bio. <clears throat> And so you did, I think it was maybe more pro stage stuff, correct? Theater and live performance lighting, things like that. Yeah. What's your take today on lighting and lighting control and smart fixtures, the IP addressable fixtures, the circadian rhythm style lighting? That's, I mean, there's just tremendous buzz in the industry on the, in the resi side of the world today around this types of technologies. What's, what's your read on all that? Ooh. We're very excited by that. Um, you know, I'll take you back when we first came over from the from the UK. I was very surprised at how simplistic lighting was over here in the residential market. You know, it was the four recessed cans and the laid out in the ceiling and you're done in a room, kind of, you know, and, and multi-million dollar homes. And I wasn't used to that. And I think that was very, you know, I know that California is a, slightly different there was a lot more creativity in the lighting design there and certain in other parts of the country as well but here in texas it was very rudimentary it was very much the electrician dropped in four ceiling cans job's done you know i, I thought that there was a missed opportunity there so you know i thought well we could bring in some sophistication into this market some different lighting technologies and when we started to see uh circadian rhythm come in i thought this is perfect this is this is what the residential market needs we can bring in some lighting technologies that, that have been more commercially used in the past, DMX driven or KNX driven type technologies and, and start to deploy them in the residential market. And, you know, as you see that trend continuing, I think it's only going to grow more and more. And I can see more and more of that market moving to us. We're, we're ideally situated as a specialist to blend all of the technologies together into one operating system, you know, and, rather than the electrician for us that is is quite simple to take that part of the project from the electrician are you seeing friction in taking that from the electrician or well, there can be there can be but you know again if you've got if you've already um demonstrated the technology to the homeowner the homeowner leads that conversation you know they, they it's what they want you know and and they, they'll tell the builder no this is the technology that we want to use Love it. Uh, Bill, I'm going to ask you, uh, our audience is of all shapes and sizes and uh, years of tenure and experience. And so what would be a, a word of advice or wisdom that you would share to a, another business operator in our space somewhere in the world? Maybe a lesson you learned along the way that uh, if they heard you now and took it to heart, it might make their business a little bit better or maybe their quality of life a little bit better. Uh you know, I've been doing this a long time now, but, you know, it's a bit cliched, but never stop learning. Never stop learning. Technology is marching forward and you don't want to be left behind. Invest the time and energy in learning new technologies, embracing new technology, and break out your comfort zone. Continually push out of your comfort zone. If you're not, if you're too comfortable, you're not trying hard enough is kind of what I like to say. Do you hold yourself to that measure? I mean, yeah. I, I I resonate with that statement a lot. I find if I'm comfortable, I know I'm doing something wrong and I, I have to push harder because when I'm a little uncomfortable, I know I'm probably on the right path. When, I, when I'm a little uncomfortable, um, I know that we're pushing the boundaries, you know, and it can certainly make my people a little bit even more uncomfortable than I am. But I think that helps us all develop as a team and as a company. 
as we keep pushing the boundaries of what we offer and what we do. Love it. Bill, thank you for joining us on show 195 of Automation Unplugged. Uh, for our listeners that want to get in touch with you directly or learn more about your business, where would you send them? Sure. It's been a pleasure, Ron. Thank you for inviting me on. You can contact me at uh, igshomeworks.com or my email address is bill at igshomeworks.com. Awesome. Bill, thank you again for joining me on the show. Thank you, Ron. All right, folks, there you have it. Uh, that was a lot of fun. We covered so much ground in that interview. Don't forget, if you are tuned in and you're watching and listening on Facebook or LinkedIn, uh, please like, share, comment, drop in a comment. The algorithms love that. And uh, I'll drop in there and I'll, I'll say hello. And, and I know Bill will as well. And uh, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, if you have not already done so, please subscribe uh, to the show on your favorite podcast app. I know that uh, I personally, and you all know this because I've said this so many times, I'm uh, addicted sounds bad, but I have the lifelong learner in me has really uh, fallen in love with podcasting as a format for learning. And uh, anything under the rainbow that you would hope to learn about, whether it's you know, hearing from integrators in our space and or learning about history or science or math or, you know, murder novel, murder novellas or whatever you enjoy listening to or consuming, it's on podcast. You really should check it out if you haven't done so already. And uh, I also, I just want to tie into that last point that Bill was making about being uncomfortable. You know, if you think about when you go to the gym, and when you push yourself at the gym, or maybe you don't go, I, by the way, I don't go to the gym. I walk and I work out in my garage. So I, I haven't gone to the gym in years. And, uh, but I do, I do work out and I do stretch. I'm about as limber as a stiff board. So I, I have to stretch often just to protect my back. And uh, it's really when you hurt a little bit that you know you're doing your body good. And uh, it's definitely the same as it relates to business and you know, business is about survival of the fittest. If you're not pushing yourself and growing and learning and challenging your team, others are going to come and eat your lunch. That's guaranteed. That's not even a maybe. And so if you're finding yourself comfortable and what I don't mean, so let me give you what I don't mean right now. Everyone's busy. And so I don't mean because you're working 70 hours a week, that's not the sort of uncomfortableness that Bill's talking about or that I'm talking about. That's just working harder, not necessarily smarter. So the uncomfortableness is really about stretching yourself to learn new techniques, maybe to be better at delegation and bringing people onto your team to do more so that ultimately you can achieve more. Maybe it's picking up new vendors. Maybe it's trading off. Maybe it's picking up new areas of growth for your business and really doing the work, rolling up your sleeves to win that new type of work. It can mean a lot of things and it can be very personal, but you know, challenge yourself to be a little uncomfortable. And what you'll find on the other side of that is typically growth. So I thought that was wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, I am going to sign off now. Bill, don't leave me. I see you down there. And uh, folks, I will see you. You know what? I'll see you on Friday because uh, we're going to have Brenna on. Brenna's a member of our writing team, longtime member. She's an SEO specialist. And if you want to learn about how to really jazz up your ability to get found on search and or what it means to write engaging content, either tune in or have members of your team that work on such things. And uh, there'll be a lot of wisdom shared on Friday. So this is a special week. There's a two for one this week, two shows, and I, I will see you all there. So I'm going to say bye for now, and I will see you all on Friday.